On January 7, 2020, the music industry lost one of its most respected and beloved musicians, the drummer for Rush, Neil Peart. He was only 67 years old, and he lost his battle to brain cancer at the time. And obviously, the music industry was very saddened by that news. I found out it via a text from a friend of mine, and you know, he just said, did you hear the news about Neil Peart? And I'm like, you know, what is he talking about? And then I looked it up and it's all over the internet. So it was a pretty, pretty devastating day for me. He was a huge influence on the way I see music in general, not just drumming. He made me want to play the drums and that's what I ended up doing. I've played in a few bands, you know, not professionally, but, you know, having fun with uh, bandmates and whatnot. And my style of drumming <laughs> is, you know, hugely influenced by him. And there are many songs that I've played from different bands and a lot of the techniques that Neil Peart used in his songs, I've put them in these songs, even though they're bands that have nothing to do with Rush, but it just fit in the song so well. It wasn't that the songs even sounded like Rush, but when you play them, you can tell that I was influenced by him. At the time that he died, there was a lot of noise on YouTube, not bad noise, but a lot of people making videos expressing their condolences and doing tributes, you know, reacting to his drum solos and whatnot. And me personally, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. I just thought, well, I'll let things be and maybe sometime I'll, I'll make a video myself about Neil, the drummer and the person. And not that I knew him personally, I never met him, but I felt like many people feel that it's almost like you knew him almost at a personal level because of how prolific he was with his lyrics and how much he expressed himself. I kind of felt that way a little bit. I think I kind of know a little bit of what Neil thought about things. Would I have liked to have met him? Absolutely. But I can't pretend a stranger is a long-awaited friend. So this video is coming out a year from his passing. And I thought, you know, after reflecting on it a little bit, I thought I'd just talk about a few of the things that made him my favorite drummer. And I made a little list and I just wanted to quickly mention them. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I just wanted to show what made him my not only favorite drummer, but my favorite artist. You know, going above even being a drummer, above being, being a musician, but just the artist in general. What things made him my favorite artist? And obviously most of it is related to his drumming style, but some of it also has to do with the person himself. One of the things I admired about him is that no part of his kit was wasted, regardless of the era he was in. So when he joined the band, he had you know a pretty big kit. It was a, it was a double bass kit. Um, but in all of the songs, he tastefully used all of it. It wasn't for show. It wasn't like some bands that I've seen where the drummer has a huge kit, but you don't see that he's using it that much. Neil was very melodic. He was purposeful with his drumming. And as his kit grew, when he impl implemented percussion, you know, the cowbells and, and the chimes and wood blocks and all of these different instruments, as you can see from his kit during the 70s and the early 80s, he didn't waste anything. If the song required it, he put it in. And if there was a way to use percussion or any part of his kit to make the song better, then he would put that in tastefully. And the best example probably of this is the song Xanadu, especially the live version from 1981 his incredible use of his whole kit. It seemed like he used every part of his kit for that song and nothing was overdone, but it was expertly played. Another thing I loved about Neil as a drummer, as an artist is he was not just a drummer, he was a composer. And many times he talked about how he not only positioned his drums, but how he tuned his drums in a particular way so that they would be very melodic. There's no getting around that drumming is pretty much a rhythm exercise. It's not really about melody. It's about keeping the beat. It's about providing a measure, basically, that the band can play to. But it seems like Neil was, he was outside of that. He really played his drums in a melodic way. So the song needed that melody from the drums for it to sound like Rush. Obviously, you have the melody from the guitar and the bass and the keyboards, but it was so interesting that Neil would, it was able to compose his drum parts so that there was melody to them and his drumming was very musical in a world where a lot of emphasis is given to technicality that was not his thing his thing was more about composing about composing drum parts that fit the song and he did that expertly and he actually to me he put to rest the issue of needing to be technical 
it's definitely beneficial to be technical and it's very important to have chops but ultimately when the end user or the listener is hearing the song they're not caring about the technique they're mostly caring about the song itself the melodies and how they remember the song unless you're a drummer and you're specifically looking for technique but that's the minority of people most people they hear music because of the melodies and his drumming was a huge part of that melody of Rush because he was a composer of drums and not just a player of drums. Another thing I admired about Neil and this was something that Getty Lee mentioned actually and that struck home, struck home with me was that he was a monster musician and it was interesting that Getty used that expression about Neil not just that he was a monster drummer he was a monster musician and he was a monster musician because like I mentioned before he didn't just play the drums just to play the drums to put in uh, ch chops or show off uh, how many rudiments he knew, put them in the song, however. He was a musician and everything was meticulous about how he made his drum parts because he wanted it to sound always musical. And he would slave over drum parts to make sure that they would sound musical and not just sound like he was keeping a beat. And it's actually pretty admirable, the work that he put in to make sure that his part was just as musical as Alex's chords or Giddy Lee's uh, keyboards. Another thing I liked about Neil is that he had his opinions, but he didn't force them on you. Throughout his writing as the lyricist for Rush, you would see a lot of his opinions, but you'd never, he wasn't the kind of person who would force them on you, like, you know, say that you had to think this way. It was just his opinion about it. And he was happy to express them, and he was happy that someone would even listen to them at all. Um, whether you disagreed with him or not, I don't think to him it mattered. What mattered was that he was able to express what he thought and that people appreciated how, they ex how he expressed it. Not only through his words, but through how his bandmates created the music around those lyrics and how at the end he was happy with how his opinion was expressed through the band. And never in a way that was talking down to you, but mostly talking with you. Another thing I like, the lyrics itself, the, the fact that he was a lyric, the lyricist of the band. And it's very interesting to see the progression of his writing style throughout the years. When he was very young, I think he was very idealistic, you know, with songs like uh, Something for Nothing and A Farewell to Kings and Anthem, Beneath, Between and Behind. Those songs, to me, they are very like idealistic. A young writer expressing, exercising his, his ability to write. It was very impressive for someone so young to write the way he did and to introduce science fiction in, in the lyrics based on the books he liked to read. And then later on, he got more philosophical during the 80s and 90s. And then actually, I think in the 90s, it got more personal where he would write more from a personal point of view, more like talking with a friend about what he thought about different things, be it uh, political issues or personal issues, interrelation, even romantic issues like songs like Cold Fire. No one could write about romance like Neil Peart did on that song. But it's just interesting how his lyrical style evolved over the years. And he didn't stay stuck in one genre of, of writing lyrics, let's say. He evolved as he matured as a writer, as an artist. Uh, so, did, so did the lyrics. And it showed throughout the years. And it was always very interesting. I also like that he didn't hoard his lyrics. It's very interesting where he was very reliant on Getty as his editor because Getty had to sing the songs, get, had to sing his lyrics. And he was okay with uh, Getty editing the lyrics that he gave him. Uh, it could have been that he took out, Getty took out whole lines or whole, you know, whole, whole paragraphs or even most of the song most of the lyrics that he that he gave and he was happy to go back and rewrite or whatever. He, he didn't say, no, this is what I want to say and this is how it's got to be done. He was very free, accepting criticism of his lyrics and because he was considerate of the person who had to sing them, that maybe the person wasn't always going to agree with what he wrote. So eventually there was a consensus that would come up where Getty was comfortable singing the song. And that's ultimately because Neil wasn't stuck up about his lyrics being sung exactly how, how it was written. He was very flexible with that. And that actually contributed, obviously, to the songs coming out the way they did. Another thing I liked about Neil, the intent that he played every single note. 
if you look at his face when he plays, I mean, it looks like he, you know, when he composes his drum parts, he knows why, or he knew why he played every single note the way he did. It seemed like there was nothing random. And he, he left his ran the randomness for when he did solos. But for the songs, every note to me, when I watched him play and when I hear them, it seemed like everything was put there specifically for a reason. And that intent in playing for a young person growing up listening to Rush, to me that was very impressive. And it made an impression on me that uh, when you're playing the drums, you gotta have an, you know, unless you're playing for randomness, just for random sake, you need to have an intent. You need to know what you want to do so that you're not flopping around when you're playing. Um, you know that there's a beginning, middle, and end. There's, you know, there are verses and choruses and bridges and all that stuff. And you need to know where you are. Uh, you need to play with intent. And I never saw a more intent, more intense player uh, than he was. And the absolute energy that it took to play like he did. And he did it night after night, uh, tour after tour. And... It was amazing to me to see how in the end, even in the R40 tour, when he was in his 60s, that he could still play with that energy, with that intensity. That's something that uh, I admired about him. Another thing I noticed about him that I thought was pretty peculiar is that he never played the same thing twice in a song. Um, if you look at songs like Distant Early Warning, Far Cry, there's a bunch of others where you know the chorus would come around and every time the chorus comes around, the transitions, um, you know, in between the lines that the singer is singing, the fill is different every time it's different. And the way, you know, to come up with all of those different variations of fills that you'd have to play over and over in a song and remember them all. And then when you're playing them live, you're also playing those fills differently every single time you come around to that same part of the song. I thought it was pretty crazy. Um, it's so easy to just play the same thing when the chorus comes back because the words are the same, the music is typically the same, but Neil could not do it. And from an interview that I saw with Geddy Lee, uh, he also mentioned that they had a hard time convincing Neil to play the same pattern again when that motif of the song reoccurred, unless there was a really good reason that it served the song. Otherwise, Neil would just come up with something different. And actually made it more interesting to watch him play and to listen because it, it, it wouldn't be boring because you, you would know hearing the song for the first time you don't know what to expect and then when you hear it subsequent times you see the genius of how he would create these drum fills every time those uh, same parts of the song came along and it actually you know it moved the conversation along basically in the song because of the way he varied those fills throughout the song it just made things a lot more interesting and it informed the way I play as well. Even when I'm covering other songs from other bands, I do that too. <laughs> and um, the musicians I play with, they notice that the songs sound more, no, they sound more interesting because the, the, the drumming is a little busier and it just fills in the space more because you're putting in variety in those fills. And that's something I learned from Neil. I think the last thing I'm gonna say about Neil as far as one of the reasons I, I admired him so much and that he's actually my favorite all-time drummer, musician, artist. I think the main thing is that he was a humble guy. He was very reserved instead of being extroverted. He was a fer very funny guy. He always wanted to be treated just like everybody else. He never wanted to be famous. He just wanted to be recognized as someone who plays the drums. And for someone who had that kind of stature in the music industry, having not asked for it, just based merely on his talent and his humility, that goes a long way as far as making an impression on anybody who wants to become a musician or just wants to play for fun. That is the best attitude to have when you're playing with other people. If you are humble, you are wanting to make the whole experience better. In the case of Rush, he wanted to make the song better and he would do whatever it took to make the song better. And to do that, it requires humility because it requires that you have to hold back when the song doesn't require more from you. And also it requires you to step up when the song requires more of you. And your, your humility allows you to do all that. And throughout all of the years of Rush creating music, I think his humility was one of the things that most made him the drummer the musician, the artist that he was. And that's something that's sorely missed in a lot of music today. 
No, but we have the music. We have 20 studio albums. We have all of the live albums. We have all the live videos. I'm hoping to see more music to be unearthed somewhere in the ar deep archives of Rush, videos of tours past that maybe we haven't seen. And we'll continue this to see why Neil Peart is considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, rock drummer of all time. He certainly is in my book. Yeah, I miss the guy. I never met him, but to me, from a musical perspective, he was my mentor. He was my teacher. And I miss him.